Hello, my name is William, and today I'm going to be talking about gender fluidity in Georgian portraits. And so I've selected two portraits from the National Portrait Gallery, one of Cheval Dion by Thomas Stewart after Jean-Laurent Mosnier from 1792, and the other one of Dorothy Jordan by John Hopper from just one year earlier, 1791. And what better place to talk about Georgian portraiture than the National Portrait Gallery? Some essential background on portraiture is that it is an elite art. Only those who could afford to have themselves painted could get a portrait. Most people painted are members of the aristocracy. However, by the end of the 18th century, more and more people are getting access to portraits. And we can see this by a remark made by the Earl of Fife in 1796, who says, Before this entry, very few people presented themselves as a painter. As lately, when everybody almost who can afford 20 pounds has the portraits of himself, wife, and children, even with the aid of the annual exhibition, we will hardly be able to find out the numerous bad painters and uninteresting, obscure persons represented. And so we can see that in the 18th century, portraiture really explodes. So what is the significance of portraiture in the 18th century? According to Marcia Poynton in her book, Hanging the Head, Portraiture and Social Formation in 18th Century England, she argues that it is necessary not only to look closely at individual portraits, but also to excavate portraiture as a system, as a shaping and defining mechanism in terms of class, rank, and gender. And here I've provided two examples that we've studied, one of Mrs. Mr. And Mr. and Mrs. Andrews by Thomas Gainsborough, in which the portrait is made to emphasize their class and their ownership over the land, and how that ownership emphasizes their status. The other portrait I've chosen as an example is the Lady's Waldgrave by Sir Joshua Reynolds, in which he's painted the, the women in all white as the three fates in order to show their grace, their innocence, their purity. And it worked because these women got married just a year after this portrait was made. And so thus, portraits are more than just likenesses. They are a means to show one's status. And so it's with this background that we will be examining the two portraits today. And I've decided to start with the portrait of Chevalier. And I'm immediately struck by the colors. They are incredibly harmonious. The red of the metal and the bow and the chair looks amazing with the olive green background that happens to match the olive green of Chevalier's eyes. Furthermore, the feathers in the sitter's hat match the color of the dress and the black of the dress matches the black of the hat. So you have a very harmonious composition in which complementary colors work together in which a small palette is used. Furthermore, it is a very grounded composition. If one draws a triangle from the middle of the sitter's face down past their shoulders into the other corner of their body, it creates a pyramid shape, which shows that it's a very stable composition. Furthermore, Cervalier is set in space. They're sitting on a chair which grounds the sitter. Now, if we look at details on the portrait, we can tell a lot about the sitter. Chevalier was born in France in 1728 and had a long and tumultuous life. One aspect that tells us about this is the Croix de Saint-Louis medal that Chevalier wears. This medal was awarded for military service and diplomatic service as a soldier and diplomat of France. As a diplomat and soldier, Chevalier fought in the Seven Years' War, and helped bring about the negotiations that ended it. However, their political career was cut short when they were exiled from France for insubordination on orders of Louis XV. Due to their exile, they fled to Britain, where they became a sensation, not as a soldier, but as a fencer, as they would fence in women's clothing. And indeed, they would fence wearing the clothes that they are pictured in in this portrait including the Croix de Saint-Louis medal. Now, the hat contains a ribbon that is the colors of the revolutionary French flag. And this certainly highlights that Chevalier was scorned by their exile 
and it is now supporting the revolutionary government in France as opposed to the king they served under. And finally, the serious contemplative expression on Chevalier's face can show that they were a member of society and perhaps not always accepted, but at least part of it. And we could see this based on people's reactions to them. Edmund Burke called them a monster, while feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft praised them for being able to fence and be a soldier as a woman. And indeed, they were quite a famous fencer, as even George III attended their fencing matches. And thus, all this together can show us that maybe Chevalier was a respected member of society. Clearly, they were accomplished, as shown by this portrait and the stable composition, harmonious colors, and facial expression show them to be refined and genuine. So even though not everyone agreed with their expression, it was certainly something that everyone had to see and deal with. And that is important. Next, let us turn to the portrait of Dorothy Jordan. Here, Dorothy is not shown as herself, but rather as a character she played on stage. She was a comedic actress, famous for her cross-dressing roles. And here, she is depicted as breeches from the play She Would and She Would Not, where a soldier, played by Dorothy, cross-dresses in order to flee to Madrid to be with her lover. And aspects of this portrait tell us that she's a comedic actress. Here on her face, you could see she has a slight smirk, her crow's feet are visible, and her dimples are creased. Her face is flushed. And this smirk tells us that she could be an actress, as according to Nicholas Jeeves, it is a well-established fact that the only people who smiled in life and in art were the poor, the lewd, the drunk, the innocent, and the entertainment, which Dorothy was. She was entertainment. And this is further brought home by certain aspects of her dress. Her hat is askew. Her fabric is creased. She holds a magnifying glass. It looks like she might be about to put that magnifying glass up to her eye. She's in movement. She's slightly off center. She's not grounded. She's perhaps standing on her two feet, not seated. And so what could this tell us? This tells us that she is a com comedic actress. And she, most of all, is playing a part in which cross-dressing is a part of, but it is part of the joke and the humor in that part. And finally, it perhaps shows us that she has some sexual undertones. The glimmer in her eye, the sultry stare, and the smirk can all be traced back, back to her highly publicized affair with the Duke of Clarence William, who would go on to become King William IV. And so a comparison of these portraits shows that both sitters are dressed in clothing that does not align with their birth gender. Both are not full length, as is typical for feminine or feminine presenting sitters at the time, and both highlight aspects of each sitter's career. For Chevalier, their military and diplomatic and fencing career. For Dorothy, her acting career. But the biggest difference between these two portraits is Chevalier is shown as themselves. It is a serious, refined, and grounded portrait. Whereas Dorothy is shown as perhaps facetious. She is playing a character and her, port her portrait is much less grounded. And why does this matter? Overall, it shows us that serious or comedic, Georgian society interacted with aspects and forms of gender fluidity. Even if they did not agree, even if it was a joke, even if it was a spectacle, they were forced to confront it and they knew that it was something that existed and that was real. And this is crucial, especially in a society in which we are told being non-binary or being gender fluid is something new, is something radical, is part of a new agenda, a liberal agenda. It is important to acknowledge that it has always existed and will always exist. And these portraits can show us that. Thank you.